didn't say he's worthy of some of the things, it said he's worthy of it all. He is worthy of it all. Come on, y'all. We came to worship the king. While you're standing, I'm going to read for you in your hearing 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 16. And you can follow along on the screen, but pay attention to these words. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, nor greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we worship you today. And we come before you asking, Father, that you would take your word and use it for which you have sent it to do. Help us, God, to be the church, to do what you call the church to do. Help us, Father, to understand the structure of the church, to understand the importance of leadership, to understand how you've called and how we are to select leaders. And I pray for every single person, Lord, even the children, to be able to comprehend how the gospel intersects with leadership. Lord, help us to do your will and your way. Help us to uh, place our agenda under the agenda of your word and your plan. Father, I pray as we leave this place today, we will do what you've called us to do. We will be obedient to your word and your way, and we will follow in your steps. So God, I pray that you use me right now to share your word from this text and to encourage those who believe and strengthen those you're calling to lead. And to help those who may not know you as Lord and Savior to come to know you as Savior as you draw them to yourself. Help me to decrease that you might increase. May you get all of the glory. And may we leave this place today. And may we say what those did on the road to Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us as your spirit spoke to our hearts. Father, bless this time. And help us to prepare to respond. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So today I want to talk about the importance that you share in identifying leaders that God has placed among you, that God has a structure in the church. When we looked at that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3, some of you received a text from me this week that asked the question, what is the nature and purpose of the church? That was asked at the conference I was at with pastors and lay people and everybody else. And it was so interesting that, that a lot of people 
did not understand how to answer the question. What is the nature and what is the purpose of the church? First of all, and when you came in today, if you met me already, I, I said this to you. Welcome to the house of God where the church meets. The house of God, that's the building. This house is a house of prayer. That's what he said about the temple. But you, the people of God, you are the church. You make up the church. The church is not, not a place to go to. You are the church. Then the key is, so what is the nature of the church? What am I? Who am I? And it says in this passage, the pillar and ground of the truth. The nature of the church, it, it is the truth on earth. It is the representation in body form of Jesus on the earth. And, and I think because we don't understand the nature of the church, we don't understand what's supposed to be happening in discipleship or leadership. We don't, have, we don't understand biblically these things, and then what we do is we incorporate our own thoughts and our own ideas into how we view these things, and what is at stake is the growth of the disciples, the growth of God's people. God's people cannot grow unless we grow according to God's standard, the way God is calling us to grow. God is, God is structured, and God has put in place a way for his people to grow. It is very clear in Scripture. Why do we keep trying to circumvent the Scripture? Why, when we get to leadership, why do we want to control leaders? Why, why do we believe that we align ourselves with leaders that are like us or think like us? And what I want to share with you today is leadership in the church is not something you pick and choose. It's something you identify. Because God has given to the church gifted leaders. And if God has prepared and given to us leaders, we don't say, I want this one. We look around to see the fruit, to see who has God given to us. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And that, that, that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is we're trying to pick leaders instead of us identifying leaders. There's a difference between picking and identifying. When I go to play basketball, especially right now at 53 years of age, and I played some basketball in the last two weeks, I look around to pick somebody to play with me. When I was younger, it didn't matter who it was. Now it matters. <laughs> now it matters, right? And I will look around and see the skills and see what I want and say, oh, I'll pick this person, right? I still, get, I still get to be the person to pick, Malik. I still get to pick. <laughs> so so it's, 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 that's, that's picking. But when I go to the airport to pick up somebody I don't know, I'm identifying the person. You see the difference? The difference is, one is, I'm looking for what I want. The other one is, I'm looking for who's showing up. Don't, don't miss that, because we miss it. We miss it. We miss the point, because all we're doing is we keep looking for things to do, and some of us are looking for what other people are looking for, instead of understanding that leadership is something that God has given the church. Let me ask you this question. Do you want what God has for you? You said yes. You say yes. So that brings us to this passage, and that brings us to uh, the point. And, and the next month, I'm doing this message today for several reasons. One, God wants me to. Two, it's timely, because in the next month of August, we will be selecting or looking to see if the people that are coming before you are gifted in teaching and preaching to the place where we as a church, united, want to put our stamp on them as like we identify them as leaders God has chosen. Now, here's the thing, and you might be thinking about it, and I have a paper right here that all of you guys will get next week. I have it in my hand right now, so if you want to see it, you can. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, but here's the thing. The thing is, if a person is not identified, they're going to be upset, right? Right? Because nobody wants to lead, and everybody wants to lead. Right? You talk to people, oh, I want to lead. But if you tell them you can't do this, you find out, that, well, then what's your problem? Or if you tell somebody you're not ready to do this, I know you think you are, but you're not ready to do this. Maybe God has identified you, but something that uh, Brother Carrington said yesterday in the morning's Bible study, maybe it's not time. Maybe you need more time. And maybe you're sitting here in this congregation or you're online, and God has identified you as one of his leaders, but you won't lead. You, you're too afraid. You're too timid. You got shame. You got some sin. You got something going on in your life, and that's what happens. Godly, identified, chosen leaders are setting among us, and then what we do is we let anybody with a pulse rise up and take out the trash and say, now they should lead. 
This has everything to do with the gospel. Because the reason the gospel can't go forward the way it's supposed to be is because we won't do the things God has called us to do according to God's designed order. And so in this passage, and you notice here, Paul tells Timothy at the end of the passage which we read, I'm showing you how there should be order in the church. This is what it should look like. And so there are three things I'm going to give you three things to identify godly leadership from this passage. And number one is a fruitful desire. A fruitful desire. In verse number one of 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, this is a faithful saying, a man, if a man desires the position of a bishop. Now let's talk about a bishop just for a second so that we understand, because we got bishops everywhere. We call people bishops. You got a bishop in Rome. You got a bishop. You know, the bishop, the word means overseer, Right? So the word overseer is this is the person that God selected from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. That overseer is going to be the person that's over, overseeing everything else. That makes sense. That's the overseer. That's the bishop, if you want to call him a bishop, because that's what the New King James says it. But it's really an overseer. All right? That person is the overseer. That person's primary responsibility is to feed and oversee, to feed the flock and oversee it. That makes sense. Today in a Baptist church, that's the other problem. We've got so many denominations and so many different I- identifiers. In a Baptist church, we call that the pastor. Today in this mega church movement, we call it the lead pastor. You can call it whatever you want to. The Bible says that's the overseer. That is the person that is to oversee the entire thing. That person is accountable to every single person and God to lead the church the way God has called them to lead the church. Now, that overseer also, there's another office called an elder, and the elder is the same thing that most Baptist churches call the pastors. They also can fit in this category. So this category can fit for at least three different offices. Bishop, pastor, elder. All right, so one through seven, that's what we're talking about. And the first thing we're looking for is a fruitful desire in that person. Is there a desire there in that person? So look at what, look what he says. This, he goes on. This is what he says. He desires a good work. That means that person... God is working in that person, and that person wants to see people saved. That person wants to see people grow. That that person wants to see people move from wherever they are to Christ-likeness. And more than likely, they're already doing it. I remember when God called me, when I really sensed that God was calling me, I was already doing what God was calling me to do when I was working at NASA. I was doing Bible studies. I was helping people. I was encouraging people. I was leading people there, and God just called me to somewhere else, and I didn't want to do it. If I could be really honest with you, until a year ago, I still didn't really want to do it, right? Yeah, I know, and I've been doing this for 15 years, right? And I really, I mean, because that's, that's just where it is. I'm like, God, I could be doing so many other things. You want me to do this? And he's like, yes, I want you to do that. And you got to do that better than you doing it. That's what he told me. So I took a whole sabbatical. So many of you know I'm on sabbatical right now. So last September, I announced that. And then from January to this January, I'm on sabbatical. What that means is I just preach and teach and let the deacons take care of everything else. That, that's what's supposed to be happening, all right? Just, just, just to let you know. That's what's supposed to be happening. Uh, so that I can just concentrate on my relationship with God, concentrate on um, what God is want me, wanting me to do, and God has really made that clear at this point, uh, you know, to lead. So now I'm like, okay, God, I know what you want me to do. I know you call me to do what you call me to do. You call me to oversee and feed, and I want, now I want to do that. <laughs> I really want to do it in the church. I don't mind doing it in the world. How many of y'all know it's easier to deal with the people in the world than it is to deal with the people in the church? I don't have any problem with the people in the world. When you come in the church, it's like, oh, my goodness, what are we doing? Are you lying and not telling me the truth? Right? Are you stealing and, not, and looking at me like I stole something? Are you, what? So they desire a good work. It is a good work. It's a God work. It is not, it's not for the faint-hearted. It's not something that, that everybody should be wanting to do, actually. And it's not something everybody can do. From chapter 2, it is not something for women to do. And let me tell you something, it's not something for every man to do either. God selects this type of leader. All right? And so we need to understand that. We need to be on clear on that. God is the one who made these rules, not me. I got real quiet. Okay, so so you turn back in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 10. The Holy Spirit gives the Apostle Paul these words. He says, 
but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And then he keeps reading. For the one thing, Jonathan said this in one of the uh, urbans that he did. One of the things we don't do is we read verses out of context. We read a couple of verses and we stop. What you need to read is, is the whole First Timothy. You got to read the entire letter to understand the weight of what he's saying. And when you get to chapter 3, he's like, and this is who the leader should be. And here they should be male, but it ain't every male. <laughs> it's, just, it's not any man. It's not. It's certain men that he's called. Certain men that should exude character. Certain men that should have a connection with the people. And then through that character and that connection, you see a call. And, and I think we can have a character with somebody over here, but our character might be different over here. We might think over here we're good, but over here people think, this, they, they think something negative about you. Now, we might be talking about leaders, but guess what? All of us in this room are leaders, in one sense. We're leading someone to Christ. If you're part of the church, you are doing that. And what you should be able to do is look to your leaders for an example and instruction and direction when you are not having a good day. Or when you just need clarity. Character, connectivity with people. I was watching, you should know this. So it's hard for me to detach from here anyway, because I, I do love y'all and I love being here. I love, I love it. But, you know, y'all know the church got broken into. Y'all know that. And, they, and so Damien did an awesome job of getting security and cameras. So now you probably can't move in this building without something happening. Uh, <laughs> so shout out to Damien and Vivint, right? They did a good job. Yeah. So, so I'm looking at the cameras. I'm looking at the cameras. And this is going to sting a little bit. And I see people in our church, and I see people walk right by them. I see people in our church. Just sitting there, not members, here for manna or whatever. I see people walk by. And I said, I'm going to watch this camera until somebody speaks to them. The person that spoke to them was not a member of our church. A person walked by them and spoke to them, and that person spoke. There's two cameras sitting right there. I shouldn't even tell you where they are. They're sitting right there on that black table. Right there were two songs looking at me. There was somebody sitting, two people right there. The people were sitting right beside that table. And finally, I saw a person, not a member of United, walk by and speak to them. And I said, look at all these people, these godly people, these people about the gospel, these people that love Jesus that will walk by this person. And I know somebody saying, oh, I spoke to them earlier. Okay. But I didn't know that looking at the camera. <laughs> okay. And so if I'm looking at the camera, I'm like, what is wrong with y'all? Why you don't speak to the people? You spoke to them once, ain't it enough? I think some people say, man, Pastor Bill, we missed you, I think, because I speak to all of you. If you come by me, I speak to you. I love on you. Yeah, I want it. It should be out. It should be. Because, yes, the word is coming forward. Whoever's standing up here, we're teaching the word. But we got to live out this word. There has to be character and there has to be a connection. There has to be a relationship. We're talking about leadership and you're leading people. We're not doing tasks. We're trying to get people closer to Jesus. How are they going to get closer to Jesus if I shove you a bag? I'm not saying I saw that. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying I saw that. Well, I shove you a bag of manna and say, all right, you have a good day. No, 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 no. I'm giving you a bag of food so I can sit down and share Jesus with you. So I can sit down and share my testimony with you. So it just gives me a great opportunity to make the situation not so awkward so that we can share Christ because that's the love of our lives. Right? I mean, I've been gone for two weeks. Did it change? Right? I mean, he should be the love of my life, right? So every, everything, vibes, everything we're doing, it should be to the glory of God. And look, I don't blame you. I blame me. It's my fault. I take full responsibility. It's my fault. I take full responsibility. But I tell you right now, from this day forward, it's not going to be my fault. Oh, amen, because I'm going to do what I need to do, what's necessary. And I'm going to tell you right now, some of you are not going to like it. But you need to hear the truth. It's the truth that will make you free. So I'm apologizing to you. I'm apologizing to you. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to give you a Bible verse, and I'm going to say I love you. But here's what the Word of God says. 
This is what we're supposed to be doing. What the Word of God says. And that's connecting the character, and then you can see the calling, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's not easy. And then not only should you see a desire that's fruitful, a desire to love the people, a desire to connect with the people, but then you, see, you should see discipline in your leader. So look at the next, the next few verses. Look at what it says. And we went through this list, but just listen to it again. The bishop must be blameless. Let, let, uh, turn your Bibles really quickly to Psalm 119. I sent this to my, one of my brothers this week. But here's another thing we're going to stop doing in here. We're going to stop it today. I guarantee you it stops today. We're going to stop saying that we sinners and ain't nobody perfect. We're going to stop saying that. We know you're not perfect. We know I'm not perfect. How about we get somebody the word of God? When you got to find a verse and read the verse. Stop saying that, right? Here's why. Look at Psalm 119, verse 1 through. Listen. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do, what did it say? And wait, oh, I don't, yeah, y'all don't want to say that. Let's do it again. Come on. Let's read this verse together on three. One, two, three. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Oh, let's do it again. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. So then the problem is, it's not we all sinners know. The problem is, verse 2, the problem is who seek him with the whole heart. That's why what, we, what people are saying is true, because we're not seeking him with all of our heart. But when you seek God with all your heart, and I'm not talking about being perfect. We're going to make mistakes. I'm about to make more mistakes than I ever did, because I'm free. Right? I'm free. I'm going to lead you, and I'm going to make some mistakes. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to make some mistakes. I guarantee it. But I'm going to lead you the way God is calling me to lead you. But listen, this is what it says. They do know iniquity, and they walk in his ways. So my thing is to surrender my heart to God and to seek God with all my heart. And I guarantee if I do that, I'm going to sin less. I'm not going to be sinless. I'm not going to be sinless until I leave this body, but I'm going to sin a lot less. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's what I want to hear from now I guarantee if I hear it again, that person won't, I guarantee you, that person will not be speaking from this place. We stand up and say, all of us are sinners. No, you're not, unless you are an unbeliever. If you're a believer, Paul addresses every single church as saints. Now, you might be in sin, but you got to get out of sin. Yeah, get out of sin. And stop making an excuse for your own sin. Man, I found myself through this God just wrenching me. I found myself wanting to sin. I was like, yeah, man, we're we going to sin. He's like, man, you know better than that. Like, okay, God, I was in Florida. There's plenty of opportunities to sin. I'm talking about it in my mind, right? I'm not talking about physically. My wife would kill me. But in my mind, I had plenty of opportunities to sin. But and I was like, well, everybody's going to sin, right? I might as well do it in Florida. <laughs> it's like, no, who told you that? I mean, you know better. I mean, the Holy Spirit talks to me. You know better than that. I'm like, wait, I'm listening so much to the people around me. I'm starting to buy into that foolishness. And I told Nevea, I told Nevea, and I said, Nevea, you ready? Because this, this one is going to be a little different. Blameless, the husband of one wife. And that talks about being sexually pure, even in your mind. Temperate, meaning able to have self-control, sober-minded in my thought life. Good behavior, hospitable. I ought to be hospitable. I ought to be able to speak. You shouldn't walk by a person that's a leader and they don't speak to you. They got a problem with you. I just did a whole message on false teaching and offenses and you're going to tell me uh, as leaders, and I'm now I'm looking at all of us as leaders, we have a problem with someone, we can't do what the word says? Woo! Hey, you know, I don't preach anymore until September, so I'm going to give it all to you today, all right? Not violent. Not violent. I got to say that for me. I got to keep saying that for me because uh, sometimes in my mind, I done messed up a whole bunch of stuff. I didn't punch the wall and all that. But you can't be violent. Not greedy for money. Mm -hmm. 
heard a person say that, that uh, they learned from a con artist that you could always con two people, the greedy and the needy. That means if you're greedy or you're needy, you can be manipulated. That means things people say, things they do, they can persuade you because either you're greedy or you're needy. But when you're content, they can't con you. And even in this book, he says, he'll say, when we have food and clothing, let us therefore be content. A leader shouldn't be greedy for money, and on the flip side, they should be generous in their giving. How can somebody lead if they don't want to give to the Lord? You got no business leading, you definitely ain't going to lead me, but you got no business leading anybody if you don't give to the Lord. Because our heart strings and money is connected to who we follow. So we ought to be giving to the Lord and admitting we've been poor stewards somewhere. Something, both can't be true. Oh, I, I, look, I already know. I already know. It's okay. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. You got to do the best you can. But in your household, if you're a leader, you got to lead that household the best you can. If you have adults living in your household, you have to lead them as best you can. Let, they, they should respect you, and they should understand and know that you have a love for the Lord. They should not be disrespecting you in your household. I have two young adults, and you know it, and I told them. I said, only one person running this house. Only one. Only one. When you get to the place where you want to run this house, that's the day you leave. And you say, ain't neither one of them there now. Right? They didn't make a comment, but their lifestyles made a comment. Right? So if you're going to, come, you're going to stay in this house, you're going to do it this way. But if you go outside this house, you got to answer to God. You had to answer to God anyway, but I was the under shepherd. Right? But you got to answer to God out there because you still got consequences for whatever you're doing. So you got to do the best you can. And I know we got some parents. I know I talked to a lady in a restaurant yesterday. And she said, I got a teenage daughter. She's 15 and she hates me right now, but it's okay. I was a teen too. That's what she said. And I understand it. I understand it. But some of our teenagers got to understand that we love God and your parents want the best for you. Parents are leaders. The father, the mother, you're leaders. You're leading that family. You're leading your household. You're leading those children. You're leading your wife if you're a husband. You're leading them. So everything I'm saying also responds or it is required of you as a husband. Verse 5, he comments, he says, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? How if your house is messed up, how are you going to run the house of God? Your finances in your house is messed up and things about to get repossessed. How can you run the house of God? Good night, it got quiet in this piece. <laughs> if your wife is leading you in home, how are you going to lead the house of God? You got all these women in here. Come on, just think about some of this stuff. Think about it. How are you going to lead God's house and God's people if you can't lead your home? Who is the example? How are you going to be an example for somebody else? Remember, God is the one that puts you in leadership if you're there. We're just trying to identify the qualities. We're identifying, yes, God has picked that person. Whew. That's, that's a good sound. That's a good sound. That's a good sound. I don't even hear the crickets. Can I keep going? Y'all want me to stop? Okay, all right. I, just want, I want your permission. All right. So he, so he goes on and he says, also, not a novice. Lest being puffed up with pride, he fall in the same condemnation of the devil. How can you be saved for two years and then you want to lead something? You've been walking for Christ for two minutes and you know everything. Satan ain't attacked you. Matter of fact, Satan ain't puffed you up and you want to lead. You can lead it better than everybody else. And you've been walking with Christ for two whole minutes. He says, not a novice. They can't be a novice. They can't be new in the faith. They need to be tested. He's going to go on and say that in a few minutes with the deacons. They need to be tested. 
And, and look, I need all of you. We need everybody to be looking among us and saying, hey, I believe this person is called to lead. I, believe that I, can, I think God has identified this person. And some of the people God has identified, they don't want to do it. They just don't want to do it. And so they're walking around like they don't care. Right? But how many of y'all know you can't run from God? Like, you ain't going to win. You ain't going to win that battle. You're going to lose that battle at some point. I say surrender now. Right? And it caused you a whole lot less heartache. And you can bless some people sooner. It says, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now look, we could, I, I, thought about, um, I thought about this, just preaching the whole message on pride. Because we got a lot of pride in, the, in here. Now how did we get so prideful? How did we get so prideful? Woo. Yeah, we got a lot. We won't ask for help. We don't need help. We don't want nobody to know we got help. We don't tell nobody we help somebody. Thank you. Well, God's people ought to be able to come and say, hey, I have a need. I know Leroy, he's not here today, but Leroy, like, can you help me or not? <laughs> like, uh, Leroy, we'll do our best, brother. Come on, y'all. How we get so prideful? God's people. God hates pride. And some people mistake confidence for pride. You can be confident and still not be prideful. Prideful is when I assert my views, my values, and my way above yours. And I only look out for myself. And it's so interesting how people can see things when it, can, when it relates to them. You know, like in Acts 6, the people that were being neglected, they said, we're being neglected. Now, I don't know what the true situation was, but I know at the end of the day, they said, hey, go and find some people to help to make sure they're not neglected. But it's interesting when it's coming down my street, I can feel some kind of way. But what about the other people that might feel the same kind of way? Be quiet in here, man. That's too, it's too quiet. Where my amen corner? Where my amen corner? At least you ain't got nothing to say. No, don't do that. I'm, I'm just joking. I'm just, I'm just joking. I right, bless your heart. Bless your heart. <laughs> and I did that. That's my fault. I called you out. But it is quiet. I mean, come on. I mean, then somebody will come up to me and they say, and I, and I thank you for it. It's like, hey, we listening. So somebody will say, hey, we listening. We listening. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that, that we, we just listen to what God is saying. And, and uh, look, the leader shouldn't be full of pride, shouldn't have pride, shouldn't be putting themselves over others. And I think some people assume pride in areas. Like you assume something happened and you say, well, that's how he wanted it. That may, that, that may not be true. You, you probably need to ask a question. Right? The only thing I care about is the word of God and the people of God. I don't care about your floor. I don't, I don't care about your curtains. I don't care. Now, there's some people that care. I don't. He put that floor down there because Pope said put that. Nope, unless it's durable. That's all I care about. It's going to keep you safe. It's going to last long. I don't care what color it is. Them curtains purple because he wanted them purple. I don't care what color they are. You don't like them purple? Give us a different color. Right? All I care about is the word of God and the people of God. Word of God and the people of God. Don't come to me and tell me I care about something else. I care about the word of God and the people of God. If I'm in an area, assume it has something to do with the word of God or the people of God. That's why he's there. Because it has something to do. I was downstairs with Tim and them cutting up them window pieces yesterday. Because I care about the people of God and the word of God. Y'all follow me this morning? All right. Okay, good. Because I got a little bit more to go. Okay. So not a novice. We understand that. Lest you be... Falling into the same condemnation as the devil. Now think about the devil. Think about the condemnation. The Bible says he, he shows up as an angel of light. I, I really, I really, I, I'm going to say, you know, there are some good, godly people that the devil is using. Hey, they're godly. They love God. But they got issues, and Satan is using them issues to create division in our midst. And, and what, what I've learned is it's not the person. It's not you. It's the devil. Remember Peter when he, when, when he told Jesus, he's like, 
You won't surely die. <laughs> I mean, come on, Peter is going to be the rock of the church. His profession of faith is going to be what God uses to build his church. It's not Peter that's the problem. It's the enemy using Peter. But Peter has this affection to Jesus and doesn't understand love right yet, and so he doesn't want to lose Jesus. And so when Jesus starts declaring the powerful word of God, Peter says, I don't want to lose him, and the enemy enters him, and he speaks a lie. And that's happening in our midst. Some people that love God, they love God, but the enemy is using them. I told my wife, the enemy can use me too. If I, it, it can use any of us. I'm not saying, he can use me too. He can use any of us. And what I mean by use, he can't get in me and possess me. But if I got some insecurities, I got something going on, and somebody says something, then the enemy can say, whisper in my ear something. They don't trust you. They don't think you follow God. And then I'm talking back to this, this, I want to call him something, but I'm not. You know, like, why wouldn't they trust me? I'm following God. I'm following God more than they all are. And he's like, yeah, listen to yourself. Right? So, yeah, he can do the same thing in me. So all of us need to, need to look and see, you know, who is, what, whatever I'm fighting for, whatever I'm passionate for, whatever I'm calling for, is it from God? And then we'll use God. And the enemy is just having his way until the leader shows up. He's here. He's here. Holy Spirit just didn't beat me. So now I got to share, right? But it's awesome because he loves us. That's why he does what he does. Verse 8 and following says, Likewise, the deacons must be reverent not double tongue, not giving to much wine. Again, not giving to much wine, not taking over by substance, not abusing a substance, not greedy for money, similar, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. That's an interesting discipline, right? To hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. To be about the things of God. To be about God. To be about the faith. To be about the doctrines of the faith. To help people understand the truth of God. Deacons should be able to do that. They should have a pure conscience where what they care about is people getting sound teaching and sound doctrine. It says, but let them also first be tested. Now that's where you guys come in. Because you gotta you gotta tell you gotta look around and you gotta test people and you gotta see if these people should be serving, if these people should be leading you, if they can be identified as I believe God has called them. Because guess what? It may be somebody God has called and you don't even like. You might not like them, but God's called them. What you want to do is look at the fruit. Do I see a desire that's fruitful? Do I see discipline in their life that's fruitful? Do I see them moving toward spiritual maturity? Do I see it? Can I see it with my eyes? Or is it manufactured? Do you only see it when on Sunday morning? Or do you only see it when it's your turn to speak? Or do you see it across the board? In seminary, there's a story where, where a guy came and they, they brought a, a group of people that were going to be elders and they brought them to a retreat and they were getting off the bus and one of the persons there asked people to bring the luggage and they did. And so then the last person was on the bus and he was coming off. He said, oh, you want me to get the luggage? He said, no, I want you to go in and clean the bathroom. And the guy said, man, no, nah, man, God didn't call me to clean bathrooms. And they said, hey, get back on the bus. God didn't call you. I mean, that's a great test. It's a true story. A servant of God is willing to do whatever for the glory of God. They don't care. They don't look at the task. They say, if this is what, God, this is what you want me to do, you the leader, this is what you want me to do, I'm doing it. They don't, they don't question that. They don't have a question. Beware of people that question everything the leader is saying to do. Because if your leader is from God, then why wouldn't you go to God and say, God, did you tell us to do this? I remember doing COVID. It's one of the toughest times we had here at United. And I respect Jonathan Montgomery a whole lot. Because Jonathan Montgomery, Damien said, I'm with you whatever you do. I think Sharif did too. Jonathan Montgomery said, and said hey, I think it's a mistake <laughs> for us to meet, right? And I respect him a whole lot, still do. Why? Because at least he said what he was thinking. I was sitting there, and I won't absolutely show up, but the Spirit of God was saying, keep meeting. Keep meeting. Abide by the law and keep meeting. Keep doing it. And we got people that did all sorts of kinds of things. And people don't understand, as a leader, I went through, okay, God, is this the right thing? 
you got people's families involved. And all I kept hearing God say is, do you trust me? I'm like, God, I trust you, but I'm not sure they trust you. I'll be there. You know, and you're trying to, you know, and, 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 and I couldn't communicate it like I wanted to because I, I didn't have clarity. All I know is God's telling me to do this. I, I couldn't tell you how, when, where. I couldn't prophesy. I said, it's going to be over in three years. Nope, I didn't get that word. They were saying it on TV. <laughs> that, hey, it'll be over in about three years. That's what they were saying. But I didn't get that word from God. All I got was keep meeting and keep sharing the word. That's all I kept getting. And, and people are here, I'm like, it was, it was one of the most, and any pastor, any leader that's led through COVID, that is a very, that was very difficult to do. And God led us through it. God prepared us for it. And God led us through it. But it was tough as a leader. But what's more important is when leaders stand up and say, hey, this is what I'm feeling and thinking. Because then we can pray. Well, people don't say nothing. They look like they're with you, but they're really not. And that's the worst feeling because you feel it. You can feel when people are not with you, can't you? Can't you feel when people are not for you, they're not with you? You can feel it. You can feel, no, nah, that person ain't for me. But they're for Jesus. I don't doubt that, but they're not for me. So how do we, how do, we do this thing together? Y'all getting to understand what it's like to lead? Are you starting to feel? I want you to feel it. I want you to feel what it's like to lead. Because when you come into any leader, you got to understand what they're going through. And the number one thing is what does God want? That's the number one thing. What does God want? What does God's word say? And then we'll deal with the rest. So holding, oh, I got all of that. Out of holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience and letting them be tested. And then after they're tested, let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Verse 11, likewise, their wives, and I do believe this is wives and not female deacons, even though there could be female um, servants of God, not a problem with that, but I don't think Paul is talking about female deacons here. Some people do. Some people take this passage right here, and they say here he's talking about female deacons, and that's why they have deaconesses. You, You came from places where you heard that. Uh, here we don't have that. We do have assistance to the deacons. We have a deacons, um, what, what do we call it? Deacons support ministry that's made up of women. And then somebody asked me, does it have to only be women? And I said, well, I guess it doesn't have to be only women. We ask some weird questions, don't we? Um, I think it was a man, he'd be a deacon. But, it, but if you're not a deacon, but you want to help, I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't know. Uh, but probably not, and here's why. Verse number 12, it says, let deacons be the husbands of one wife. And so if it was, then why would he then come back and clarify talking about the wife? You know, that just doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to some of the people y'all listen to. But you, it's got to make sense to you when you read the word. When you read the word of God, you read down through this passage, you got to be like, yep, he's talking about female deacons, like Phoebe. But I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's talking about the wives of the deacons. And it makes sense to me because he's about the family and the church and the wives of the deacons have to also have character and connections and a calling along with their husband. You know, some women, some of you wives, they'd be like, well, he didn't call me, but y'all won. <laughs> I think y'all forgot that y'all won. Y'all ain't too. But you know what? That's the other problem, right? My son learning that lesson right now. It, it, it's, a lot of people get married, right? But they don't become one. They still two. But they don't become one. But you became one. So what does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean that we became one? So why are you sitting there saying he didn't call me and y'all won? Y'all won. So if he says the call and you're his helpmate and you're there with him, he's called you as well. I hope that helps somebody. Woo! I like it. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. The same thing you heard for the elder, the bishop, bishop, and the pastor. Then verse 13, I want to give you some clarity in verse 13. I'm almost about to close. In verse 13, it says, for those who have served well as deacons. In this translation, it says deacons, but really, it shouldn't say that. The word here is the same word that is translated deacon, but also is translated minister. If you turned over to chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse number 6, in the New King James Version, if you could put it on the screen, It says, if you instruct the brethren, he's talking to Timothy, if you instruct the brethren these things, you will be a good minister. Same word. Why didn't it say you'll be a good deacon? It didn't. Because it understands that the word there doesn't mean that. The word can mean deacon, minister, or servant. 
And so I think what he's really saying, going back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 13, I think all of those who serve in the ministry that God is calling them to, not just deacons, but elders, bishops, pastors, deacons, deacons' wives, all of us that serve in this capacity, we obtain for ourselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That means that doing the ministry should do something for us. It should do something for us. This is what it should do. It should give us a good standing in the faith. We should be godly. We should be holy. We should be striving. And it gives us honor or it allows us to honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why somebody should aspire to be a deacon or somebody should aspire to be a pastor or something like that because I can glorify God in this way. But you're looking for an opportunity to suffer. And I think we don't understand either. The leaders are looking for an opportunity to suffer, not be glamorized, not be, photo, not be uh, uh, put on a, in a photo shoot. But we came to suffer. We came to fight for the gospel. We came to contend for the truth. We came to set the captives free. We came to be Christ on earth. We came to live this thing out loud, even if it means we die. That's what it means to be a leader in God's church. It didn't mean I eat first. I mean, I always get the microphone. I came to die. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you want to do this, you're going to suffer. And is that what you can't do? Is that what you want to do? You're going to suffer in your body. You're going to suffer in your mind. You're going to suffer in your emotions. You're going to suffer in your family. You're going to suffer. Because you have an enemy and God is perfecting us. We got weaknesses. We got issues. And God is using all those things to perfect us and make us more like his son. And then the enemy is coming after us. The more we get more like Christ, the less he wants us to shine. And even if you're in the, in the seat and you're a lay person, you're, getting, you're drawing near to Christ. And you're growing, you're growing in your faith. He's coming after you. Because he does not want to see other people. He doesn't want to see people see an example. He wants people to look in the church and see what they've seen. Hypocrites. He wants them to look in the church and not see truth. And see inconsistency. He wants them to look in the church and see division, see animosity. He doesn't want to see hope and love and joy and peace. He doesn't want to see that because everybody wants that. Everybody wants joy and love and peace. But if you can show it in the church and there's division and people shooting people in the church and fighting in the church, I'm going to the club. Oh, yeah, because at least when they get to shooting, they get to, shoot, they get to shooting when, it's, when I was growing up. You know, I know y'all do it differently now. It, it, they shoot their visuals and everything. But when I was growing up, at least everybody danced and did that thing in the club. Then when you went outside, you were ducking. Right? I know I'm old, right? That was back in the day. And then he says, in the end of this, in conclusion, he says, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. It is the church of the living God. Do you not understand that our God is alive? Our God is alive. He is a living God. He is not a dead God. He's not hang Jesus is not hanging on a cross. The cross is empty. He died with all power in his hand. Listen, listen. He is calling sinners to repentance, not to a resort. He, he is calling us to live and to die for him. He is not calling us to get rich. He, he is calling us to represent him, to be his body on the earth. He is not calling us to be designers. He's calling us to let the world know we are salt, we are light, we ought to make a difference, we ought to be changing, we are not to tolerate the practicing of sin. We are the church of the living God. He's alive, and he ought to be living in you. The pillar and ground of the truth. And people want to know the truth, they shouldn't be Googling it, they should be going to a church and say, I need to know the truth about who God is. And every single member in that church ought to be to tell people who God is. They ought to be to tell him he is everlasting from everlasting. He created everything from nothing. He exists in three persons. And he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. And he died on that cross. He took on all the sin of the world. He rose on the third day. He is alive and he offers salvation freely to those who come. Oh, sinner, come. 
to Jesus. And if you're here today, look, that's who we came to worship. That's who we came to serve. The Lord Jesus and Jesus, like my brother said right there, Howard, he is coming back. Like Chelsea said on TikTok, there are people ramping up. Jesus is coming back. He is going to come back, and he's looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's not looking for people that can sing hymns and curse people out when they get home. He's not looking for people that can quote scripture and run people off the highway. He is looking for holy, separated, humble worshipers of himself. And it takes godly, revealed leadership to keep pointing us all in that direction so that we don't lose sight of who God has called us to be. And then he says at the end, and without controversy, this mystery of godliness should perplex us until we see him face to face. It says that God was made known in the flesh, Jesus becoming flesh. God, all-powerful God, Jesus reducing himself to flesh, coming in the form of a fetus to deliver us from our sins. It, it says this is a mystery that will make your head hurt until he comes. How did you put God in this little package? He was justified in the Spirit, lived his life through the Holy Spirit. Everything that he did made known and made right that he is the rightful heir to the throne of Jacob and the throne of heaven. In every single way, he did not sin. He did not think of sin. He was perfect in every single way, a spotless lamb. He was seen by the angels. The angels are looking at Jesus, looking at what he's going through, looking at how much he loves humanity, looking at how much he loves you and me. You know, and incidentally, I thought about this. Me and my wife were driving. We've done a lot of traveling. We got caught up in that whole airplane thing, and they canceled all our flights and all that. We had such a time. I'm so glad you guys are praying for us because uh, God used it all in an amazing way. But, you know, you see a lot of people that, that have signs. And a lot of people that have the signs have some of our God on them. God bless you. Uh, can you help me? Thank God. And I told Myra, I said, yeah, they're they not atheists. And I told her, I said, you know why? I said, because they know that the people that help them are people that believe in God. The people that stop and help homeless people are the people that believe in God or, or every now and then you get humanitarians that just want to help you out. But they know by and large, I need to put God on the sign. Guaranteed if they just had a sign that said, help me, they're going to get a lot less help. And they know it. I'm just like state to state, everywhere you go, somebody got a sign that says, God bless you, thank you, um, in Jesus' name, something like that. They're like, why? Because they know. Even if they don't even believe, maybe they don't believe in God, but they think you believe in God, and if you believe in God, you're going to do what God says, and you're going to be a generous giver to the person on the road. I was listening to the Proverbs this morning. It says you ought to give to that person, not even thinking about it. Because that's what we do as believers. Unbelievers sure do enjoy true believers. Think about it. They sure do enjoy true believers. Come when you find them. You work with a true believer, you live with a true believer, you get on the side of the road with a true believer, and you got an opportunity, you got a chance. You get on there with somebody showing up hellbound, and you got a problem. <laughs> yeah, you got a problem. He was preached among the Gentiles, and that's what the church, the, the duty of the church is to make disciples, is to continue to preach to, to the world. He was believed on, listen, in the world. He was believed on in the world. This is, a, this is mysterious how Jesus has been believed on all over the globe, and that's true. He's been believed on all over the world, and people have rejected him all over the world. And then he was received up in glory, and he's coming back. And so now we need your help. We need your help to help identify who are the people God has called to lead and then follow that leadership. If you can't follow, you really can't lead. I always tell people, I try to tell people, 
follow people the way you want them to follow you, because that's what's going to happen. You get to lead in something, and the way you, the way you follow, oh, that's how they're going to follow you. And all of a sudden, you're going to have a problem with the way they follow you. But it's so, it's so funny to me that always this, this is always what happens, right? You, you'll tell a leader, hey, man, don't do that, don't do that. But then when you get a chance to lead, you'll do the same thing you told a leader not to do. How did you do that? If it bothered you so much then, why would you do it? Or now you understand why they did it. That's probably you understand it now. Now you understand it because you're in the position. Now you understand why they did that. But why not follow godly leadership? Because you're about to help. You're about to help me. You're about to help our existing deacons identify the leaders among you. And so what you're also committing to is, I'm going to follow them because I want God's best. See, that was the question earlier, is do you want God's best? If God has called God to lead us, then bringing them to our church so that we can identify them, so that then we can put them to work, do you want God's best? Now, what God's best means is some of them people are going to tell you no. Some of them people are going to pull you to the side and say, you shouldn't have said that. Some of them people are going to say, hey, I overheard a conversation that you just had, and the Lord don't have what's going on to work like that. Ain't nobody ever pulled me to the side. Ain't nobody ever talked to me. And then how about, your, how about you yourself as a leader? Some of us are sitting here and God is now calling us not into leadership, but into submission to him and to sanctification from sin. And it's funny, and I've said this before, it's often how sometimes we mistake the call of sanctification for service. And we say, man, God is calling me. Yeah, to get out of this sin. That's what he's calling you to do. He's not calling you to preach. He's just calling you to get out of the sin. But we just sense when we hear God, we just think, oh, it must, that must be the big, the big call. Now I should go and share. What are you going to share? And, and we got to be really conscientious about making sure we're prayerful is the key. Praying, God, God, you reveal. God, you show me. God, you stir my heart. That's what I'm praying. You show me. You stir my heart. You let me know that this is somebody you have identified as a leader in this capacity. And sometimes a leader is a leader, but in a different capacity. So that more people can come to faith in Jesus. So that, we, that at the end result is more people come to faith. The end result is more people get baptized. Why? Because leaders are leading their people. We have directors, our directors here. You're leading. You're, you should, you're, you're tasked with trying to disciple the people in your leadership group. Connecting with them and making sure they're okay and sharing God's word with them and praying for them. In our church, that's the way we want to do discipleship. We want every single person connected to a person so that they are able to understand and go to them and be able to share what's going on in their lives so that God might be able to minister to them and impact them. And the only way that's going to work is if we all, so look, listen, the altar call today, the response today, some of us need to say, you know what, I haven't followed leadership the way you want me to, God, and I repent today. I just haven't followed the way I should. I question everything today. I follow. And Lord, you deal with whoever's leading. Identify who those leaders are in your life. Who are you following? Who are you following? If you're a, if you're a father, if you are a husband in the home, you are the leader of that home. Your wife might be more spiritual than you. That might be true. Let her know. You're more spiritual than me, but I got to lead this home. I got I to come up on my curve. If you need her to help you, you say, sweetie, help me. Help me grow. Help me grow so I can know God the way you know God, so I can lead you. I don't think there's nothing more attractive than that man coming. If you're more spiritual, and you might be. I'm saying, when you're talking about leadership, we're talking about spiritual leadership. We're talking about people coming to know God. You're not going to know God apart from leadership. You're just not. You're not going to be all that God would have you to be without leadership. And right now, your attitude and your, your position toward leadership is what God, the Holy Spirit, is trying to help, help us align. It's what is it. Maybe I don't like the leader. You don't have to. Understand that if God called him to lead and God called you here, this is what it looks like. I'd be the first one to tell you there could be another leader God wants you to follow. Good luck in finding But if they're online, they're probably not coming to your hospital bed when you get sick. They're probably not coming to your father's funeral. Because again, as we prepare to respond, we've been so accustomed to picking instead of identifying. 
And so I'm not saying there's anything wrong. You got a person on the line that's, 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 that's biblical and doctrinally sound. Listen to them. It's okay. That's okay. But don't be like, this is my pastor. I said, he don't know you. I think you got it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you. And we pray, God, right now that we would surrender and submit to your leadership, God, to the leadership that you've given us here at United. Uh, Lord, the, the leadership you've given the Universal Church. Thank you for the ministry and work of the apostles and prophets and what they've already done and how they laid it down. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Thank you, Lord, that we've already come past Pentecost and the Holy Spirit has come. You started the church and here we are now, Lord. There are bishops and overseers and elders and deacons that you want to raise up, that you want to identify for us here at United so that we can be the church you're calling us to be, so that we can lead and all of us would not be burdened or stressed, but, Lord, we'd be able to do what you're calling us to do. Then if we're here, Lord, and we haven't followed leadership, if we're not following leadership in the church, we're probably not following it in our home, probably not following it on our job, we're probably doing what we want to do. And today, Lord, what you're saying is we got to humble ourselves and say we're just going to do what the leaders are asking us to do as they follow Jesus. Lord, if there are leaders that are out of line, start it with me. God, if, if some way I'm out of line, if some way I am not glorifying you or just wrong in some way, reveal it to my heart or to somebody around me, Lord, that they might come and share like Nathan shared with David. Lord, if we're doing what's right, if we're glorifying you, then Lord, give the people of United the spirit of submission and humility to follow the vision and leadership that you've given to this church through me. Lord, there's someone here today that's lost, and they listen to this message. We've got to help them understand that you love us so much that you even give us leaders. That you handpick, you choose leaders to guide, shepherd, and lead the people. You love us so much. Not only did you die and rise from the dead, but you gave gifted leaders to your church. Your Holy Spirit is there, Lord. You've done everything we need. We just need to get on your plan and do it your way. So help us right now, Lord, to respond to whatever your spirit is doing in us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.